Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. I'd like to welcome you all to another presentation of Cobb County Master Gardeners Virtual Education Series. Today's topic is Trees for the Urban Landscape. Now I'd like to welcome our speaker, UGA Cobb County Agricultural and Natural Resources Agent, Dr. Robert Trawick. Welcome, Rob. Hey guys, thanks for uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, I really enjoy this. Trees is particularly one of my passions. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's just dive right in because we got some limited time here and we got a lot to go through. So, um, one of the things I want to just go through is the definition of a tree, and um, that is it's, it's a, a plant that often reaches a 15 feet height or more at maturity, has a single trunk, or can have dominant multiple trunks. Very similar if you think about it, a crepe myrtle, you know, Natchez crepe myrtles, Tuscaroras can get really big. They can have multiple trunks, uh, has no normal branches on the lower trunk has at least a partially defined crown and it's usually larger than other plants that tend to be a long, uh, tend to be long lived. So um, when we talk about uh, planting, one of the things I want to get into is, you know, I had a professor that was uh, my major professor at Auburn used to always tell me, take, take care of the roots and the top will take care of itself 99 times out of 100. So we, soil is very important. Proper planting is extremely important. So when we're talking about soil characteristics, we're talking about soil texture, how compacted is the soil? If the soil is very compacted. You know, the roots are not going to want to grow through something that's as, as hard as concrete. We want to know about moisture and drainage. Drainage is particularly important for a lot of different trees. Uh, fertility and pH. A uh, good thing to do is, you know, we offer soil tests through the UGA Extension Office that can tell you what your uh, nutrients are and what the pH is of your soil because pH can help determine whether or not nutrients can be taken up by the plant. Uh, you know, what the temperature is, and that's like the top uh, part, particularly of the soil, any contaminations like salt. Uh, you know, that's not a huge issue down here. It's a bigger issue further north, but it is something to be concerned about because salt can cause a lot of a lot of problems. We're talking about environmental conditions, you know, some of the things we need to think about are light patterns. You know, western sun is a completely different animal or afternoon sun is a completely different animal than morning sun. Uh, you know, when we're talking about, you know, glare off of pavement, some other heat, things like that. Are there power lines? I always say, look up, look down, look all around before you plant anything. You don't want to be planting under power lines because, believe me, the uh, the power company doesn't care uh, what your tree is. Uh, if it's around a power line, they will cut through it. Planting space, big, big thing right off the beginning. You know, when we're talking about planting space, we want to make sure we put the right tree in the right place or the right plant in the right place. As you can see, this tree is not exactly getting the right space that it needs. The, uh, you know, I, I would certainly say I would not want to live in either of those two houses that are right behind it. Right tree, right place. We want to talk about, you know, what's the mature size of this tree going to be? What's the shape going to be? Is it going to be a vase shape type tree like a, uh, uh, let's say an elm or, you know, Chinese elm or Zelkova where it has a very vase shape or is it going to be a much round headed tree? What's the growth rate? I usually find that trees that are, um, you know, that are slower growing are usually your longer living trees versus trees that are faster growing. The faster growing ones seem to be in a hurry to die. Uh, you know, branching pattern, again, that base shape versus just straight out. Uh, you know, are, is it uh, leaves? Are we talking about, is it deciduous or is it evergreen? And then uh, looking at flowers, fruit, seeds, and bark, we'll look at some of these different characteristics. Uh, but again, when we're looking at soil, we want to make sure that we have proper drainage. Drainage is a huge factor 
And uh, with a few exceptions, most trees have no interest in growing in waterlogged soil. Um, roots need oxygen just as much as they need water. And if, uh, if, if uh, water is infiltrating you know, in there, um, there's not gonna be enough oxygen for those trees to survive. So when I talk about you know, a large growth tree, you know, thinking about in the future, you can see this magnolia here, you know, it was planted in a great spot because look here, you know, 30 years later, this is a good mature sized tree that's in a great spot in a great place. Uh, and, and it doesn't have anything around it that can cause issues like where you're forced to prune it. And, you know, and I see this quite a bit on crepe myrtles. Again, talking about crepe myrtles uh, like, like Natchez and Tuscarora, where you can have these multi trunks, that can be a tree if it gets, you know, you know these 30, 40 feet height. Um, but you want to make sure they have plenty of space to grow and thrive. So planting is extremely important. So, um, you know, when we, when we plant, we want to make sure that we take care of those roots. Because as I mentioned a minute ago, when the slides weren't going, you know, if we take care of the roots, the top will take care of itself 99 times out of 100. So we want uh, fall and winter. We're now getting into the best time of the year to plant trees and, sh and particularly the woody ornamentals, but trees particularly. Um, you want to dig that planting hole at least two to three times wider than the root ball. The hole should be no deeper than the depth of that root ball. So you want the top of that root ball, you know, right there at the at the uh, level of the existing soil. Um, and when we're talking about plants that are you know, trees that are growing in a container, we want to make sure that we take those plants out of the container and we cut the roots. And, and cut the, uh, the, you know, if it's root bound, we wanna make sure those roots get stretched out so that they can grow. If you don't go through this step, what you'll find is that, um, particularly what you'll find is, is, is that they'll continue circling just like they're in a container. So don't be afraid to get in there and take some, you know, uh, a knife, or I used a carpet cutter oftentimes with a big beak on it. I cut through and I do these vertical slits uh, two to three times around just to make sure that those roots get cut so that they will actually expand out into the native soil. But again, same time, uh, want to make sure that we plant no deeper than the root ball and then that, that, uh, that it's two to three times wider than the root ball. Uh, as far as post planting guidelines, we want to make sure we water in immediately after planting. We want to get rid of any air pockets that are there. We want to mulch. Uh, any pruning that needs to be done should be done early in the life of the tree. Uh, so that's the best time to do that. Uh, fertilizing, if we're, if, we're, if we're planting a tree right now, we do not want to do any fertilizing until spring because we do not want this thing to try to push out new growth uh, that might be burned by any, you know, cold winter snaps that come that uh, cause those, uh, those leaves to get burned off. Uh, as far as staking and guying is concerned, I try to avoid it, to be honest with you. Uh, but if you have to do it, you want to make sure that the straps are not too tight and that they're removed within a year or two because you don't want those straps to start girdling the tree. And, and uh, if they're really tight, what can end up happening is the tree can never really develop the, the girth in the trunk itself. And it'll be a very weak tree that wants to flop over from one side to or another. Mulching is a huge thing. Uh, the benefits are that it improves appearance. It stimulates root growth. It's uh, great for weed control. It reduces soil erosion, conserves soil moisture. It insulates the soil from those hot temperatures and it perfects from mechanical damage that I like to call lawnmower or weed eater disease. Because uh, you don't want to have a lawnmower or a string trimmer coming up and start to gurgle the trunk of that tree. But a big thing about this is you don't want to go any deeper really than two to three inches. You definitely want to avoid uh, what I call volcano mulching, which is when you really pile that, that mulch up around the trunk of the tree because that can just add a bunch of accentuated moisture on there and can uh, be a, an area that uh, becomes very prone to disease and insects. 
The three pr probably most common uh, mulches we use around here in uh, Cobb County are cypress mulch, pine bark mulch, and pine straw. Those all work really well. If you're on a slope, I always suggest using pine straw because that can, you know, if you put pine bark on an embankment like that, the pine bark has a tendency to slough down or the cypress mulch has a tendency to slough down and end up at the bottom of the embankment, whereas pine straw kind of maps together and you don't end up with that issue. Pruning uh, on trees is, is uh, the proper way to do it is very important. You always want to use a three cut method. Uh, the first cut, as you can see on this slide, you're going to do it about just from underneath, about maybe a quarter of the way up. The second cut is going to be on the outside of that first cut all the way through. The reason you want to do that is because if you were to cut, do that second cut first, what can happen is it can strip the cambium all the way down the trunk. So you want to cut through that underneath cambium layer. Uh, and then the final cut is going to be right there on the outside of that branch collar. You always want to cut on the outside of the branch collar. Never cut into the branch collar or do what oftentimes is referred to as a uh, flush cut. Definitely avoid a flush, flush cut. You can kind of see right here where this, this pruning uh, cut was cut right on the outside of that branch collar. And that, that wound will naturally heal over by itself. Uh, no pruning paint or any of that stuff is ever needed. It'll, it'll take care and, uh, of itself and heal that over all by itself. So again, branch collar, making sure we do that cut one underneath, cut two on the outside of it, and then that third cut is on the outside of that branch collar. If you do a flush cut, this is what's going to end up happening. You're going to cut off all that meristematic tissue that's in that branch collar, that would be there to close the wound over all by itself. So if you end up making that flush cut, this wound will never heal. It, it will sit there and it makes a huge area right there for uh, unprotected tissue that is easily become subjective to uh, decay and disease. And I wanna mention the roots. Uh, you wanna make sure that they are uh, going out all the way, you know, understand that these roots go all the way out beyond the canopy. I oftentimes think about uh, if you have a, a wine glass on a tray, you know, the wine glass is the tree itself. The tray is the root system. So it goes much further beyond the canopy than a lot of people realize. So you always want to make sure that, that you know, uh, that you don't damage the areas right there too far out on the edge of the root system. And again, this is a large maturing tree. You know, when you're located too close to sidewalks and cause structural damage, uh, that can be costly to repair. And I actually have another picture in another presentation where this tree actually did fall over exactly in the direction that you would think it would and hit the house. Um, they can also cause, you know, these, these roots can cause uh, sidewalks to uh, jut up and uh, other, you know, problems like that. Typically, I will tell you this though, roots don't tend to grow underneath the foundations of houses uh, because there's not oxygen. Those foundations are so thick that oxygen doesn't, you know, is not available under there. And again, trees roots want oxygen just as much as they want water. But under sidewalks, they aren't that, you know, sidewalks aren't that thick and you can end up with roots growing under there and causing uh, structural problems with the sidewalks. Um, beware about changing soil depth. I hear calls all the time where people wanna raise up the level of soil, change the grade of their yard. Uh, if you add just not even four to six inches, but just a couple of inches of soil, particularly a heavy clay soil over that area, uh, the root zone, it's going to uh, significantly reduce the amount of oxygen, particularly, but water also available to those roots, and the tree will end up failing. This is a tree you can see where, like, it just looks like a stick was stuck straight in the ground. There's no taper there associated with the root system whatsoever. There's no, you know, you don't see the root flare. So you can tell that this, this area, the grade was changed and there are a lot of problems associated. This tree is probably dead by now. And again, you can kind of see when you get in issues like this, you want to definitely make sure those trees just need to be taken out. 
Uh, trenching, again, you do this, uh, all you're doing is creating a hazard. Uh, obviously, they're putting in an irrigation system for this tree, but they probably, you know, took taken out more than, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the root system of this, these trees that are grouped here together. And those trees probably just really, in all honesty, need to be taken out. Uh, ball and burlap trees uh, is uh, one of the ways of taking field grown trees and planting them in the landscape. Uh, oftentimes they have these green straps associated with the ball and burlap. If those kind of things aren't removed before planting, you're going to have major issues later on. You can see the kind of damage it does. And again, construction can cause major issues. If you're, if you know, if this kind of work is being done, these trees should probably not be saved. Topping is a process where you just go through and uh, indiscriminate removal of a tree's crown, cutting off large branches, uh, the main stem of the tree, leaving these large branch stubs intact. Uh, they often die back and are vulnerable to a lot of decay, just like doing those flush cuts and, re and uh, result in a profusion of unsightly and weakly attached adventitious branches. Oftentimes, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of things called suckers. Suckers are what that adventitious growth is. But when you start cutting off trees like this, it's just, it's the end of the tree. The trees will never recover from anything like either of these slides. So going through the uh, classes of trees that we use here in the South, Typically, we're, like I said, we're dealing with gymnosperms and angiosperms. Now, our gymnosperms are softwoods, uh, talking about uh, arbovides, pines, uh, you know, trees of that nature. And then we have angiosperms, which are our hardwoods, our broadleaf trees, and that can also include palms and yuccas. Uh, our softwood trees um, will, uh, they have foliage that is either needles or scales. Their reproduction is done through cones. And again, examples are pines, hemlocks, cedars, and cypresses. Hardwoods have, you know, broadleaf foliage. They reproduce by flowers. And good examples of these are maples, oaks, pecans, and walnut. So switching on from there, let's go through some different trees that uh, I like and uh, some others that we should definitely work to avoid here in the landscape. So going through uh, red maple. Um, red maple is a great tree. Uh, it it uh, typically gets about 60 feet by 40 feet. It uh, has great fall color. It's a nice shade tree. There are some great cultivars like uh, red, sunset, red, sunset, red, sunset, red sunset. October Glory or Autumn Blaze. Autumn Blaze is actually a cross between a red maple and a silver maple. The silver maple being very undesirable, but it, it's a it's a nice tree because it carries most of those red maple characteristics with it. Uh, there is a problem with this tree to some extent right now with the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, we've got this new invasive pest that's coming in, and unfortunately for us, red maples are one of those trees that it loves to feast on. So keep that in mind if you're considering this tree. But you can see kind of the, the color of red maples here. Uh, it's got, you know, a very nice leaf. It's green throughout the year, and again, we get this nice fall color here, uh, and in, 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 uh, this time of the year, October, uh, most of them I've seen are starting to change right about now. Flowering dogwood, I say the good, kinda. Uh, there are a lot of diseases associated with flowering dogwood. The scientific name is Cornus Florida. It, you know, people love this tree. I think nurseries sell more, more of this tree than just about probably any other tree that's out there. Uh, it has beautiful spring, uh, well, I say quote unquote flowers. They're actually modified leaves. Um, but it is a native. There's some nice uh, varieties that are out there, like Cherokee Chief, Cherokee Princess, First Lady. Uh, they come in different colors. But I also sometimes 
am a little worried about, you know, suggesting this tree because it can have some some characteristics that uh, if, an, if a tree or shrub has more than three or four insects or diseases named after it, I usually kind of pull back a little bit on my uh, recommendation list. But again, it's such a popular tree, but there are some diseases that can affect this. And, um, you know, more often than not, they, they, they can cause, have some issues. So just be prepared for that. Um, but, but again, a flower dogwood is a beautiful tree. It's a great understory tree to be planted underneath some of your, maybe your larger trees. Um, but it is, a, is, it is a nice addition to the landscape. The Coosa dogwood, this is our non-native dogwood. It's Cornus Coosa. It's a little bit later flowering than our, um, than our native dogwood. Uh, it's extremely sun tolerant. Uh, as you can see here, it can be a beautiful tree. Um, and and, and it, I, I don't see that this one has quite as many of the uh, issues that our native dogwood does. Uh, the cultivars like the Milky Way series are just excellent. They, they have some um, uh, great, great uh, plant uh, trees in there. And I, I really like that Milky Way series. Redbud. So uh, our Eastern Redbud or Circus canadensis. It is a native. Gets about 20 to 25 feet tall and wide. It's an early spring, spring bloomer. Uh, it has a nice, interesting gray bark. It's in the legume family. Uh, so similar to your peas, it's in the same family as peas and, and other things like that. And as you can see, it has that very pea-shaped, you know, type flower. Um, I really like this tree. doesn't have many issues. I know uh, ambrosia beetle, which is a beetle that's been coming in and hitting some of our thinner bark trees. Uh, has been an issue a little bit here recently, but uh, there's some really neat cultivars like uh, forest pansy. Forest pansy is really cool, uh, I think, because it has darker purple flowers and it also has uh, foliage. The foliage is heart shaped, and uh, forest pansy has a very purple heart shaped, uh, uh, you know, uh, leaf, so it stays purple throughout the year, as long as it's in enough sun to keep that purple color. If it gets in shade, it kind of reverts back to green a little bit, but, uh, but forest pansy is a really neat one. And then there's a variety called Alba, which Alba is Latin for white, and it has white flowers instead of your uh, pink. So it'll end up having little white P-shaped flowers. So great little tree, um, really like that one as well. So Eastern Redbud is certainly one that you might want to consider keeping in uh, your little book there. Bald Cypress. Now, if you remember back to that picture at the very beginning uh, where we talked about where, where I had the picture of the, the, the hole that was dug that was full of water, this is a tree that can handle your wet site needs, okay? This one, it's, uh, it is a deciduous gymnosperm. So it does drop its foliage. It is a gymnosperm. Uh, it has really nice red bronzy fall color. Uh, again, tolerant of wet or dry sites. This is that tree you see in the Louisiana swamps that is growing in the middle of a swamp area. Uh, on uh, wet sites, they do have a tendency to form knees. Uh, on dry sites, high dry sites, which they grow equally well, they won't grow the knees. I know there's been a lot of, you know, uh, research done on those knees to try to figure out why um, these, these guys actually produce those knees. The truth of the matter is no one knows. It's actually not for, for oxygen exchange or gas exchange. That's what they were thought for a long time. They had gas exchange purposes. Um, there is a cultivar out there. It's pendens. Um, it's, uh, what it does is it actually uh, has... Uh, needles that are much more pipe cleaner shaped. Uh, so they don't have the broad leaf looking foliage like you see there, but it's more of a broad leaf uh, or more of a very narrow foliage. And the tree itself is a much narrower and more upright kind of upright growth that you find uh, compared to your standard uh, bald cypress. 
So if you have wet areas, this is, again, not a lot of plants will grow in wet areas. Not a lot of trees will grow in wet areas, but this guy will do just fine. Uh, the white fringe tree, uh, which is Cyanthus virginicus, often taught, called the Grancy Graybeard. Uh, it is a, a small tree, grows about 20 feet tall. It has these beautiful uh, white flowers in the spring. And, and the whole tree will look like just a big white fuzzball in the spring. It's extremely uh, pollution tolerant. Uh, interesting thing about this tree, as far as trying to Culti uh, try to propagate this from cuttings is probably the most difficult thing I've ever tried in my life. Uh, when I was an uh, undergraduate at Auburn, I had a professor that uh, told us if we could actually propagate this by cuttings, uh, we could get an A in the class and just walk out of it without ever taking another test. Um, needless to say, I stuck about uh, 1,500 cuttings and unfortunately never got one to root, so I got a B. Southern magnolia. It's a great tree for moist, sunny sites. It is the state tree of both Louisiana and Mississippi. Scientific name is Magnolia grandiflora. As you can understand, the grandiflora grand flowers it has really nice big flowers. It is a stately large tree. It is evergreen. Uh, it has these very nice creamy flowers that you generally see in May. May is when you start seeing this. And, and one thing you might notice with Southern Magnolias is in May, the, um, the leaves have a tendency to start turning a little bit green, uh, or I'm sorry, green, yellow. So you'll start, I, tell, I call it the May yellows because the trees start pushing so much energy into these flowers that what ends up happening is that they, uh, the, what ends up happening is they, they, the, the leaves will start turning a little bit yellow. So if you see a magnolia in May and it's kind of yellowed a little bit, but it's covered with flowers, it's not a big issue at all. Tell everybody just to relax. The tree's fine. And, uh, but there are some really neat cultivars as well. Bracken's Brown Beauty is a really nice big one. It gets very nice and large, has very nice uh, kind of a brown, uh, hairy underneath the leaf. Uh, Little Jim is kind of our dwarf Southern Magnolia. It only gets about 20 to 25 feet tall, uh, maybe about 10, 15 feet wide. Again, very small, uh, you know, it's a much smaller tree. Has uh, great characteristics. Very, basically, it just looks like a mini Southern Magnolia. And you've probably seen them all over town. They use them quite a bit. Uh, but it also has a, you know, a little smaller miniature flower as well. That's a very large Southern Magnolia, by the way. Um, one thing I usually do tell people uh, with, with Southern Magnolias, they drop most of their leaves in the spring, not in the fall. Evergreens typically drop a lot of their foliage in the, in the beginning of spring. Um, so I usually tell most people to sit there and leave the trees, you know, limbed mostly all the way to the ground. That way, when the leaves fall, they just stack out underneath the branches and no one's wiser for it. Otherwise, they do drop leaves 12 months out of the year and you'll be out there picking up leaves 12 months out of the year. A willow oak or Quir Quircus fellows. This is a really great oak. I think it's probably one of my favorites. Uh, it, it does a great job. It's a great street tree. It has fine texture. In maturity, it gets about 50 feet by 40 feet wide. Uh, really great tree, has a nice kind of yellowish, bronzish fall color. Uh, very few negative attributes to this tree at all. Uh, it is, the, in my opinion, the exact opposite of its cousin, the water oak. Uh, water oaks, I used to joke around that they, uh, you know, you see a lot of them here. Water oaks have a tendency to live for, uh, they have a lifespan in urban settings for about 70 years. Uh, and typically they, they live for, you know, they live well for the first 30 to 35 years and then die for the next 40. Chinese pistache is a tree that I find is very underutilized. Uh, it's pistachia chinensis. It is related to pistachios that you, you eat. Um, this one has just amazing fall color. Uh, they typically get about 30 to 30 feet, 30 by 30 feet uh, tall and wide. 
is extremely drought resistant. I've seen these uh, actually in a parking lot in Dothan, Alabama, which is about 50 miles north of Panama City, in a little parking lot cutout, just as beautiful as can be, the most abused tree I've ever seen, and it wasn't having any problems whatsoever. Uh, it has beautiful bark, and again, the fall color looks like someone came by with a can of red Krylon spray paint and spray painted the leaves red. I think they, they actually, what I was told, they used to have these on Roswell Road in an intersection going down Roswell Road. And during the fall, the uh, wrecks would go up dramatically because people would be looking at the fall color on these Chinese pistachios. So they end up having to take them out. It is a dioecious tree, meaning there are male trees and there are female trees similar to ginkgo. Uh, but the female on this one doesn't have any weird attributes. You can kind of see a little bit, maybe the fruit right there in that picture on the right. But it is a nice round headed tree. Again, I feel like this one's vastly underutilized. Uh, Japanese Zelkova. It is, um, again, kind of. If it's in a stressed area, it's not going to do very well. It's just a fact. But it is in the elm family. Uh, so it has that very nice, very base shape. You know, elm, elm trees, all of them, whether, whether they're native or whether they're the imported elms like Zelkova and the Chinese elm, which I'll get to next, uh, they all have that nice base shape. So they do make the quintessential street tree. That's where every town in America has an elm street. Uh, they, they do have a, kind of a nice yellow fall color. They do have an exfoliating bark that kind of has a cinnamon color that, that shows up underneath. Uh, two different varieties that you'll see are uh, green base and village green. But you can kind of see the, uh, the leaves there. It's got a, a nice stellate or you know kind of nice pointed shaped leaf there. Really nice tree at times, but again, if it's going to be in a stressed area like where these trees are, uh, honestly, to the left, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. But in a front yard, it can be fine. Uh, but you can see in that picture to the left that nice face shape or upright growth habit that it has. The lace bark elm or the Chinese elm is a great tree for dry, sunny sites. Uh, all of our imported elms are, are uh, um, I was being told someone can't hear me, so I'm turning my volume up. I'm, I'm gonna try to get a little bit closer and see what I can do here. Um, so uh, the lace bark elm or the Chinese elm, almost part of folia, all of our imported elms are all resistant to Dutch elm disease, which is the disease that came through, oh, back in, you know, uh, several decades ago that really had a tendency to wipe out all of our native elms. Um, but the, um, the, uh, the, the imported elms are all resistant to this Dutch elm disease. It has a great uh, ornamental bark, as you can kind of see there. It has that, it almost looks like a puzzle when it starts falling off of it. Uh, really good street tree, again, because it has that same uh, vase shape. Uh, there's a variety called Athena that works very, very well. Uh, I've seen no issues really with that one at all. There's another variety that's out there called Drake that you might avoid because I have seen some root issues with that one for getting established. Now let's get into some of our trees that we need to avoid at all costs. So a big one here, Bradford Pear. Uh, this is my number one. Well, there, uh, I'm going to end with, I guess, my co-equal champions of trees that I hate. So I'm starting with Brad Repair. The tree has an extremely weak limb structure. Uh, as you can see, most of the branches all come out uh, at the same spot. You get very narrow, what they call crotch angles. And as the tree, as the tree grows, it literally grows itself to split. Um, fire blight, which is a bacterial disease that is, uh, that, uh, rose family members. And yes, this is in the rose family, believe it or not. Uh, the, uh, those guys, uh, is, is, it can cause dieback on these trees. Uh, there are better varieties, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, flowering pears. One is aristocrat. 
uh, doesn't have aristocrat, doesn't have the, the bad branching structure you'll find on the Bradford. Uh, but at the same time, those are kind of hard to find, to be honest with you. Uh, and the flowers, you know, while it seems like it might be the perfect kind of tree because of the flowers and the fall color, uh, the flowers do really smell pretty bad. But here's a nice little, you know, section. You can see how narrow these crotch angles are. If you look, where, you know, all of them coming up like that, these trees are just destined to split. Silver maple. Um, this is a tree I do see in a lot of neighborhoods, uh, typically because they're planted by the construction people who built the house, because they're relatively cheap and they're fast growing. Um, but silver maples have a very weak limb structure. Uh, the roots will sprout up suckers like it's uh, like like crazy. And again, there are better varieties of, of uh, maples than this guy. Uh, big thing about this, like I said, there is that autumn blaze maple that I mentioned that does have some of the characteristics of, it's mostly red, but it does have some silver characteristics. Silver maple is a fast growing tree, so that autumn blaze maple does get some of the faster growing characteristics. So it gets a little bigger faster. Uh, but as far as the straight, Silver maple, this is a tree you want to avoid. Uh, box elder, this is actually another maple. Uh, it's Acer Nagundo. Uh, really another weed tree. You'll see this a lot of areas where there are ditches uh, popping up. I almost call it the poison ivy tree because the leaves literally look like they could be poison ivy. Uh, if you go back and fo follow it, though, poison ivy has alternate leaves and uh, maples are all opposite leaves. So um, it has an insect problem with the, uh, the box elder bug that you can see right there in the picture below. Uh, and again, very much like its cousin, the silver maple has a very poor limbing and weak structure and they tend to fall apart fairly quickly. The Empress Tree, if you ever got Parade Magazine back back in the 80s and 90s when you got your Sunday newspaper, you probably saw an advertisement for this guy on the back page of Parade Magazine. This is uh, Polonia tomentosa, the Empress Tree. Its uh, claim to fame was the fact that the flowers were, the color, uh, according to the, uh, the, the uh, advertisement, the color of the royal robes of India. Um, yeah, it does have those. Colors of the royal robes of India, India but it's a prolific cedar. Uh, it'll produce these walnut type looking fruit. And inside each of those, they will have little, little alated fruit that just spread out and go everywhere. Uh, so they, they are a weed. They are a big major weed. They have a very, the tomatosa, uh, tomatosa in Latin means hairy. The leaves are very hairy to the touch. When I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee several years ago, I literally saw one of these growing out of a brick wall. Um, so they will sprout up anywhere and the wood is exceptionally weak and they just fall apart. Liquidambar styressa flua or the ever loving sweet gum. Uh, we've all had these, we all know about their fruit When you walk on it, it feels like you're uh, on roller skates. Another tree to, uh, to avoid at all costs. Uh, I know they sprout up mostly by volunteering, but um, these are trees that definitely, they do have some nice fall color, I'll give them that, but the truth of the matter is that they are more of a weed than they are a, uh, of a tree. And uh, Siberian elm, so almost pumula, not all elms are good elms, and the Siberian elm is uh, a really lousy tree. So if you see these at your garden center or anywhere, avoid this. They have a lot of disease problems. They really don't have that base shape and they have very poor structural uh, integrity. So they tend to fall apart after a couple of years. And then last but not least, I guess when I said that I really despised uh, uh, Bradford pear as 1A, 1B is going to be Leland Cypress. 
Uh, Leland cypress is often planted in screens. People, you see them all over the place. Uh, they're extremely susceptible to two particular diseases. Probably the major one is often referred to as bot rot, uh, which stands for basically as botrosphaeria, is a fungal disease that causes a canker. And you'll see these guys start dying from the bottom up. So if you haven't noticed them before, drive around your neighborhoods and you'll see these all over the place now that I've mentioned it. You'll see them all dying from the bottom up. Uh, there's no cure for the disease. Uh, but like I said, in particularly when I see a Leland Cypress, to me, it's a question of, it's not a question of if it's going to get bot rot or botrosphaeria, it's a question of when it's going to get bot rot. Um, uh, and when you plant them in screens, like most people do to kind of shade out a view or something like that, uh, it's just going to jump from one of them to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And uh, so a tree that should be avoided at all costs, they sell these like crazy at the garden centers. People still plant them. I, I wish they wouldn't because it just keeps bringing in more calls, wondering what's wrong with my Leland Cypress. Um, there is a tree that's very similar to it uh, called the uh, Green Giant Arbovitae. A green, jar, a green Giant Arbovitae is a great substitute for this tree. A very similar shape, very similar growth habit, gets about the exact same size, but doesn't have the issues with Botrosphaeria uh, that the Leland Cypress does. So again, if you see these, if you get nothing else out of these, this uh, whole presentation, avoid Leland Cypress and avoid uh, your, your uh, Bradford pears. Um, here are a couple of great sites where you can find some great information out there. The International Society of Arboriculture, I know they're going to be sending these links out uh, to everyone who participated tonight. Uh, there's also the Georgia Arborist Association. If you're looking for an arborist to do tree work uh, for, for your home, all of the uh, pe people that are associated with the Georgia Arborist Association are members of the International Society of Arboriculture. So if you ever ask anyone if they're a certified arborist, it means they're a member of the ISA or the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, UGA Warnell School of Forestry also has a great website with a lot of great information and publications. So I highly recommend going and, and taking a look at uh, their website. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.